that is sometimes is referred to as lesbian, gay, or L, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, which is added in there, which is um, a, a term used in Native communities, Native American communities, talking about um, either people who are gay or trans or gender non-conforming as kind of a broader piece, but it is added in there. Um, intersex, which I'll get to in a couple, yes. You need to look, lean into your mic and hold your body steady if you can. Okay, is this better? Yes, yes sir, yeah. All right, all right, so I'll be leaning forward right into the camera. Um, uh, intersex, which I'll talk about um, during the discussion on um, transgender issues, and then queer questioning, and then the A, what people put in for ally. So that kind of defines what that um, alphabet suit is. Um, but I don't really want to get into like what all of that stuff means. I think there's much more um, important topics to discuss. So capitalism and gay identity. So as we read in history books, homoeroticism, same-sex attraction has been throughout history. People talk about Greeks, Romans, but I would say in every society there's been um, uh, homoeroticism, same-sex attraction going on, but from our standpoint now, we wouldn't necessarily say that people then were gay. So this is something that um, is or lesbian or bisexual or transgender or queer, as this is something that's a much more modern phenomenon and having a full identity around that, which is not, that that is something that is new um, in our time. And then the question becomes, well, well, so why under capitalism? Why not um, under, you know, previously in history, did we not end up having um, a, like a full-fledged gay identity in the community? Um, so and I'm going to talk mostly like about in the U.S. and Western European societies. I'm not going to talk about other places. I'm not um, informed enough to do that. So that's kind of like where my viewpoint is coming from about this. Um, but pre-capitalism, we were living in mostly like a rural and agrarian society where everybody, what you needed to exist, your food, your clothing, um, everything was basically produced in the home as a unit. And so to you could not really exist outside of that. It would be very hard if you were a single person um, without a wife or a husband or a family. So it made it really impossible to actually um, exist outside of that kind of heterosexual nuclear family unit um, because you needed your spouse to help in the home to produce what you needed in order to live. And it wasn't really until the beginning of capitalism where if you can work for wages, do you really have to be married? But at first, for as men, I can work, I can make a wage, I can buy, and then also the things that were produced in the home are now commodities that are mass produced. So I can buy my clothing, I can buy soap, I can buy food. I don't have to have that made at home, on my farm, by people living with me. So I can live outside of that kind of um, family constructs, but it's really only under capitalism that that was actually able to be done. And so first you see that it's, it's, and we'll go through a little bit in the history, that this is men who are really able to do this first because of sexism. Women aren't able to work, aren't able to make the same wages, so they're still very much confined in that nuclear family unit. But as you see in after the 20s, and especially after World War II, that this really started to change in the U.S. and you had both men and women living outside of the nuclear family unit that really was only able to happen during that time period where I could work for a wage and live my life and then be able to actually live it according to in somewhat ways out, you know, social norms and homophobia, transphobia and, and that being constrictive but able to live with a partner if I want to live with someone, a same-sex partner that I wanted to, that was not really able or not really possible before this time period. And in particular in the U.S., it, and you look at, like, um, John D'Amelio wrote an article, uh, a book, a bomber, um, piece about called Capitalism and Gay Identity, 
in which he really does talk about like World War II being this very big change that happened, and not only in, in people being confined for long periods of time in sex segregated um, communities within the army. So I'm someone who is sexually attracted to other men. It made it very, very easy then for me to find other people because I'm 24-7 living in this community. The same thing for women. And then you have women at home um, who were able to work because they needed people to work since the men were away, and then bringing them into much greater contact with other women. And you have, you see people writing and their experiences um, either in serving in World War II or being at home of this kind of being the beginning of exploring or understanding their sexual identity and meeting other people who felt the same way they do, being in contact, um, being able to finally find people and not feel so isolated. You see this written a lot um, from people during that time period. <coughs> too, then people were coming back home from the war and they were, or um, women who were in, in the workplace and being able to keep those connections so they're not so isolated. So both of these things ended up bringing people into much greater contact with each other. And then after all of that happens, people came back, and then um, men who came back and then went to work and women were able to work, were able to keep those connections together. And so that's why we really don't see, like in the, in the U.S., um, uh, we, we had the first kind of gay rights organization that was founded in Chicago in 1924, um, the Society for Human Rights, which lasted about a year before, um, due to homophobia and all that, it was pretty much eliminated. And then you don't have, the next time that this comes around isn't until 1950 with the Medicine Society, um, which focused on more primarily gay men, but there were also um, lesbians involved in it, and then you have the Daughters of Belitis in San Francisco in 1955. <laughs> These organizations really don't start in the U.S. until the pre-war or the post-war period due to kind of the things that, that I mentioned before. So I want to stop here um, if there are any questions before I move on to the next topic of giving a little bit about the history of the communist movement and LGBT equality. Okay, Kobe. Thought about what I said. Hi, um, I'm Colby. Um, my question was, and I just want to make sure I understand uh, your argument, was that the reason that uh, the gay identity is a particular holistic identity arose under capitalism because for the first time it was possible for an entire lifestyle centered or uh, <laughs> an outward expression of uh, same-sex attraction became materially possible. I just, is that what you're suggesting? I'm just a little curious. Because I understand the point that homoeroticism has existed throughout human societies, but um, the gay identity, as you were saying, is not, been, at least is inappropriate to apply across uh, time periods. Okay, so I got that. Is there, I mean, I'll take all the questions now and then. Okay, Carl. Yeah, it's Carl. Um, based on the analysis that you put forward, uh, there's, you know, in popular literature, it's widely regarded that uh, homosexual behavior was commonplace in some ancient societies, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and uh, the examples that are usually used are behaviors by the upper classes. And I wonder if that's consistent with your analysis that, that says that in later societies, uh, the, uh, it wasn't practical, it wasn't economically feasible uh, to subsist without uh, this uh, heterosexual nuclear family. But perhaps in the upper classes, uh, they weren't so dependent on that, uh, that kind of family structure. Mm -hmm. OK. Anyone else? All right, so I'll, I'll take the um, Colby. So yeah, the, I, I think that it was really like, I mean, even, hetero, even the term heterosexuality, homosexuality, those things came into invention in like the late 1800s. So we didn't even have the language before then to actually talk about 
sexuality. I mean, it was just given that everybody was at least partially were, were in relationship to people of the opposite sex. So, but it wasn't really until that time period that I could live on my own. And I think what Carl was saying, true, yeah, maybe people who were wealthy in ancient societies could do what they kind of wanted to do, although I definitely think that when we're reading that people were expected to get married, to have children, it was very much frowned upon um, and looked down upon. And even in Greek times, and people talk about the homosexuality or homoeroticism, I should say, at, at that time period, but if you were an older man who was still engaged in sexual activity with older men, that was against the law then. And you couldn't, be, you were not viewed as then a citizen. So it was very, very much like circumscribed into very like specific situations. Maybe something that you did at one time, but you definitely had to have this other um, piece to it. And I think when it, when it gets to about oppressed people or, or working people, or poor, then that's kind of like, yeah, if I'm a regular person and I have to have a farm, where am I going to get my food? Where am I going to get my clothing? Where am I going to have people if I have cattle? Who, who is going to watch that? I have to, I have to participate in this system. Um, and it isn't until commodity production that I can buy clothes, I can buy food, I can buy soap, I can pay my rent, I can, you know, house and feed myself through my wages, even though obviously not very well because people aren't paid very well, but it at least opens up that um, possibility. I don't know if the, are those, I think I got, well, we can also come back at an, on, on that. So the kind of the history, and this is again on in Western Europe. So you really begin in Germany with the Social Democratic Party, and this is in mid 1800s onwards. And the first kind of um, thing that happened, and not first thing, but the kind of very public thing in history is a guy, uh, Johann van Schweitzer, who was a contemporary of Marx and Engels. And he was involved in the Social Democratic Party. He was a very good orator, um, organizer at that time. And he was charged for having sex in a public place, um, as people did about cruising, going to public parks, how to find potential um, sex partners or partners in general. And he was put on trial at, at this time period. And he, um, uh, the, the SDP um, defended him, and he was eventually acquitted and continued on with it. And you can see in the history that he would write letters to Marx and Engels talking about what, what he was doing outside of um, the, the criminal uh, lawsuit against him, um, and when they would write back to him, you can see they have these in the, the archives of their letters, Marx and Engels would be kind of positive to him, write back to him, but in their correspondence to each other, they were pretty uh, ridiculing of him, and were not, and definitely expressed that this is not not okay, that, he, that his sexuality is an aberration, that it's, you know, absolutely terrible, and awful. And you see this kind of in Engels, and I, I love family private property in the state and, and what it says, but if you're reading it and what Engels writes in his discussions about priests um, and the attitudes about um, homoeroticism at that time, it's very, very negative. Um, and, I mean, it's kind of the Marx and Engels, not necessarily the best people on this issue, even though probably in, in later in the time period, there was a lot of pressure in, in the movement, in the, in the socialist and labor movement in Europe at that time, and people talking about this issue, and that it was basically against the anti-sodomy laws, which made it illegal for same sex to happen. So if you were caught doing it, you could go to prison. And there was a lot of people talking about this is more anti-democratic, we need to get rid of this, connections with the church and religion, but Marx and Engels not so great um, on this issue, um, and it wasn't. And this goes on, 1890s, 1900s, and in Soviet Russia at the at the very um, early stages, uh, they got rid of their anti-sodomy laws, and there was a kind of like wellspring of sexual liberation that was happening. And even 
Lenin and, and in the government, they had people who were openly gay serving in public positions, and it was a very different kind of attitude. And you have other people like, I don't know if people have read from her, Alexandra Kolontai, who was a feminist writer at this time, and she also wrote a lot about sexual liberation, thinking about family structures differently. Um, so she's writing at this time, talking about it. Um, and it was unfortunately and during Stalin's time that the anti-sodomy laws were put back on the books, and it was um, kind, of, kind of criminalized again. Um, after he died, there was relaxation, but it wasn't until 1991 that those laws were eventually repealed. Um, and really, through the rest of the communist movement, there was a very kind of checkered and varied history. And in our own... Oh, looks like we lost Adam. Am I back? You appear to be back. Okay. Are people on on Wi-Fi? Yeah, I'm on Wi-Fi. Shut down my connection. It'll help. If you're on Wi on the Wi-Fi. Nobody's on it. Not even the office. I was. Oh, no. So, am I, am I able to continue? Can you guys hear me and see me? Lean in a little bit more to the mic. Um, can you can you hear me? Okay. That is much better when you lean in. All right. So let me get real close. So you can basically just see, just see my beard. Um, but through the the rest of the time. Um, you know, the communist movement has had a very um, checkered history with with this question on LGBT equality. And I know a lot of people talk about, so I don't want to focus just on the Soviet Union, but this was kind of also the events that were happening in Europe at that time also had an impact here. Um, and that kind of this thinking and this idea that gay people were, at least gay men, were different, that there was a separate identity from heter heterosexuality. Um, so that also had to develop. We had to first develop also the language to talk about it and then how to differentiate, which wasn't something that happened until the late 1800s. I know a lot of people talk about um, when, it, when it comes up about the communist movement and looking at Cuba as an example and not so good in the 70s and 80s. Um, people were put in work camps at that time and then that was ended and um, there was a controversy about how Cuba dealt with people who were HIV positive during the AIDS crisis in the 80s and building the sanatoriums where people could go, um, get medication, get treatment, um, learn how to take care of themselves and could either stay there or leave if they wanted to to go back and live with their families. Um, and then now you have the Senna Center, the center for, I don't know, um, but it's about the kind of the gay rights movement there. And I know people have been to Cuba, like with the Vesa Ramos Brigade or with the party. Um, I, I've been there before and, and went there um, and heard them talk about what's going on um, there now. And it's obviously it's very different. And they still deal with homophobia in society, but it's not something that's originating with um, the party and the government there. But I think overall, through history, it's kind of been a very... Um, not great um, for, the, for the most part um, attitude and understanding of this question. So here in the US, like I said, there, there was in Chicago the Society for Human Rights, which was founded in 1924, existed until 1925. And this is kind of, uh, in the history books, what people would point to as the first kind of national gay rights organization in the US. And it wasn't until, again, um, in 1950, that the Medellin Society was founded um, by Harry Hay, who was a former member at that time of the Communist Party USA. He was in the leadership in California, um, was a teacher, organizer um, there, and also was co-founded by Bob Hall and Chuck Rowland, who were members of the Communist Party from Minnesota, um, and then founded by two other people who were not in the CPUSA, James Gruber and Conrad Stevens. And the way that they looked at it was using at that time the kind of language from Marxism to talk about an oppressed national minority and taking what I mostly coming out of the Soviet Union but also here in um, our experiences in the US and the fight against racism and understanding 
then how do people who are gay or that time homosexual fit into that? And so the development of this idea of an oppressed minority is kind of where that comes from and, and understanding that. And that's what they put forward in, in organizing in the meetings. And it was also organized like on this cell structure where you were in a grouping and you only knew certain people because also at that time in the 1950s with the Red Scare, McCarthyism, if, if you got um, arrested by the police, they could blackmail you, make you tell who other people were to incriminate them. So they really tried to um, minimize that stuff. But the most important is like this idea coming out of it that gays and lesbians were an oppressed minority and understanding what that means um, and understanding kind of then like where there are similarities or shared identity between gay people in all over in the US, lesbians all over the US. Um, unfortunately in Harry Hay, and he was, some say that he, he left or was kicked out of Medellin society in 1953 due to anti-communism, and he was called for at the HUAC committees um, to testify. Um, and he left the party, and I don't have the exact date in this, in the, in the early 1950s, as quote-unquote a uh, security risk because he was gay. So if the FBI was able to get him and could, again, use this as blackmailing to be able to get names of other people who were in the party, Remember, at this time, during the Red Scare, people were being imprisoned, going on trial, for being members of the Communist Party. Um, but there was also that, in writing, that like just about every other organization at that time, it was not okay for you to be an out and open homosexual and being in the leadership of an organization. So it kind of was a bit of both. And then you have um, the Daughters of Belitis, which was founded in San Francisco by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon in 1955. Um, and they were contemporaries of Harry Hay. They had conversations with him, and they founded what would be considered the first national um, lesbian rights organization, which existed from 1955 to 1969. Um, it had chapters all across the um, U.S. So it wasn't just Medellin, which was primarily focused on gay men, though not solely, um, and also the Daughters of Elitis at this time um, in the 1950s and 1960s, organizing, um, bringing people together, which was really like this powerful thing where I'm growing up, I don't know anybody else like me. I think that I'm a freak. I don't, no one talks about it. It's all secretive, and then to be able to come into this organization and meet other people who feel like you, think like you, have the same um, issues as you was a very, at, at that time, and when you read two personal accounts of these meetings that were happening and the way that they were conducted and what people got out of it, it was a really um, liberating experience um, for people who were involved um, in those organizations. So that kind of also then brings up to 1960s, um, the Stonewall riot on June 28, 1969 at Stonewall Inn in New York, which was um, in response to the police, um, police brutality and raids on gay bars and, and here, um, and was led by people of color, a lot of them trans women of color, against the, the police raids and the harassment that were that was going on and was pretty much continuous all the time, and I get you know people know that the, this is like the beginning of the modern gay rights movement um, in the U.S. and this kind of really shook up a lot of these pre-existing organizations as well as to why they weren't didn't continue. Um, and so then also at that time in the 50s there was a lot of being accommodating, just educating, and then you get to the mix that's happening in the 60s, the new left kind of militant movements, and that's kind of where people went forward with. And then you have organizations like the Gay Liberation Front in the 1970s as well, which was part of the New Left um, at that time. And then you come to the 80s with the um, AIDS crisis and ACT UP, um, which uh, at 
that you know became the focus and I don't think a lot of people also think about that many of the leaders and activists from the 60s and 70s that entire generation died in the 1980s from HIV AIDS and losing a lot of that um, leadership and activists as well as I mean obviously new activists you know were created out of this like with ACT UP um, and then also Queer Nation which came more in the 1990s um, but that's definitely something to, to think about and to consider what would have been the impact of the AIDS crisis when yeah, it was a basically an entire lost generation not only the people then who came of age in the 80s but the leaders and the activists that were there in the 60s and in 70s. Um, that's kind of that broad thing and then we come to modern times in, in the US which last year with the marriage equality ruling and the ending of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I know there's a lot outside, inside the gay community. Do gay people, could, should queer people, gay people get married, not get married? What does that mean? But I think that those issues, and I guess this gets to a little bit about what um, Flavio brought up and I'll touch a little bit more about this on our, our unique perspective of seeing these issues of marriage equality, gay rights, transgender equality, which I'll also have a talk more about in a minute, but as firmly rooted in the democratic struggle, which is about both fighting for human dignity, that these really issues are not special issues. These are people like we should be or should have been involved because it's the right thing to do. This is about human dignity and human worth. But it's also in that connection with the democratic struggle and the struggle against the ultra-right. And both uh, in the battle of ideas and this issue about being gay, a sin, or you know, being bad or whatever, and, and, and having that kind of um, ideological back and forth where we come out on, on the other end, you know, no, it's not, but also how these issues were used in the political struggle that you have like in 2000 up until uh, marriage equality and well before that because just about every state had a law on the book saying that it was illegal for two people of the same sex to be married but how many times did this issue came up as a wedge issue during elections and people were used it to organize and divide people and how Often it was, you know, in the presidential cycles to, to get people to the polls um, and, and to vote. And to be able to have that taken off and that they can't use this anymore, that this is not an organizing strategy that they can use, it's not a wedge issue that they can use, that they have completely lost that battle, is a huge blow against them. And I think that we um, have, you know, to understand that and, and that perspective is how the, the struggle for democracy fits into um, the broader political struggle. And I think that our party and understanding the importance both, and they're not really separate, they're, they're, they're kind of the same, this issue of the economic struggle and the democratic struggle. Um, but I think that's... Um, before I get to the next section, I want to stop there and see if there were any questions or comments about what I said. Okay, uh, Diane. I just have two quick comments. Um, I was in law school at the University of Montana in 1998 when the Montana Supreme Court finally um, outlawed of the anti sodomy law. And I got to see those arguments at the Supreme Court level, and it was very, I cried. To speak for them, to the court, to actually be saying we had, they needed, we had a right to this privacy. <laughs> I'm crying now. <laughs> the other one was um, I had a, um, a friend that gave me a button. Uh, this was, you know, with the moral majority and all this bullshit, um, saying that we're going to hell, and it said, "He's your God." You burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that's an important thing. That I, I mean, I didn't mention that part, but I think 
it's important to know that it wasn't until 2003 in a Supreme Court case that the anti-sodomy laws in the U.S. were done away with. That we didn't. It wasn't actually legal in every state for people of the same sex to have sex until 2003 in the Supreme Court case. Okay, next Fabio and then James. So, just, just I mean, I, Adam, I, I agree uh, that sort of the, the progress on um, the marriage equality issue and sort of winning that, that particular battle for ideas has, has been a tremendous boon to us and a, a huge um, detriment for the far right. However, they immediately and very effectively, and it seemed to me in a pre-planned way, shifted to attacking transgender individuals with this, you know, I was I was taken aback by this crazy bathroom debate. Like, I did not see it coming. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if we had seen inklings of it before or, or what, but it seems like they immediately went to a back and face. So it makes me think that when we win this one also, what's what have what else have they planned? So yeah. um, I'll, I'll pick the next person, but then I'll come back to you, your comment. Yeah, I uh, I think it's a pretty good time. Uh, I'm James, uh, but. In, in regard to the Greek and the uh, Romans, they have sodomization, uh, lesbianism, you know, uh, homosexuality. It goes far, far back than Roman and Greek. Uh, but the timeline that you bought in, in, your, in regard to the, what happened here in, in New York, uh, and the that was an attack on. Well, I think it began, as you said, along the 80s with the moral majority. We talked about that earlier with the attack on the family. And with that attack on the family, then the uh, homosexuality, homosexual lay, uh, yeah, the LGBTQ community as a whole you know, was considered to be abnormal out of uh, normal feature by trade. So, you know, it was considered to be sinful, evil, demonic, all these other different labels were given to it. And there were actually a uh, large amount of preachers and pastors who preached this from, from the pulpits, from the various pulpits to it. And as we move further, and, and, I, and I think in terms of 2016, when uh, Donald Trump says, make America great again, okay, I, I well, see him going back to an Audrey and Harry, the leave it to Beaver, you know, mentality and lifestyle. In other words, just totally eliminating, wiping out all the games of the women, the LGBTQ community, the whole nine yards, transcend everything. But when you, when you think about making America great again, from my perspective, it's, it's going back to the 50s, the 60s, yep. you know, this sort of thing. And it wasn't necessarily that great deal out of there. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know you're, and, you're, and, and Flavio, I'll start, um, you kind of preempted because I, I definitely wanted to touch on that when I got to um, that section on transgender equality that I think is very purposeful. That because they lost the issue on gay marriage and marriage equality, they lost on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that then created this issue of the bathroom laws and, and promoting transphobia as their kind of like next step. So if we can't get that and we lost that, how do we continue to attack this community and developing it in, in this way? Um, so I think it's very, very purposeful because it's not, I mean, these bathroom laws, and I'll get more into it, it's not like transgender people started peeing in bathrooms in 2016. This has been going on for a long time. Why now? Why now are you making this an issue? And I think it's very purposeful and very much connected to, well, they want on marriage equality and these other issues, then what, what, what do we have? What kind of do we have in our bag of tricks to kind of continue to promote this? And I think, too, um, I mean, I didn't touch much about it in the 80s and the way that the Republicans responded and Ronald Reagan and how many tens of thousands of people died before the government actually took action and did anything. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I don't know, with 
uh, Reagan passed away last year, and people were talking about that and, and her role. Um, on one side, saying that you know she was very friendly to gay people, but then really on the other side of looking at what happened in the Reagan administration in the eighties, and it's connected, I think, to James and what you were saying about people. Be, it's you know it's sinful and family values, which was actually something I, I wrote this piece in Political Affairs, I think in 2004, um, about whose family values. And it's very interesting that the right wing wants to talk about gay people undermining marriage and the family when actually it's really their policies. This kind of constant of poverty wages, um, unemployment, cutting of social services, mass incarceration, all of these things and policies that they promote and that they push forward that actually really, we, we, I think that we would constitute that as an attack on the family and, and what they're doing. But they use that, they used, still now, not to as effective as it was before, but then use this issue of homophobia and transphobia to, to cloak what it is that they were doing, to put up this smoke screen to get people to not talk about what, how their policies were actually impacting families and making it very hard um, so I'm going to go on then to kind of in um, some of the current struggles um, right now, because I know a lot of people thought, well, gay marriage or marriage equality is done. What next? Or is everything great? You ended homophobia. This is it. It's happy gay days from here on out. But I think <laughs> what some of the other things that people don't think about and, and have put forward was the issue on employment and housing discrimination that in many states is still there are no legal repercussions to firing somebody because they're LGBT and that there's discrimination in housing that I as a landlord can not rent you a place to live simply because you're LGBT and there's no it's a state by state city by city case there's no federal law that um, protects people in these areas. And, I know, and some of the organizations have been talking about this is what they really want to um, focus on and address. There's also still the issue of ongoing and bullying in schools, in our, in our public school system. Um, and I'll talk, you know, something the way that people can get involved um, is on Spirit Day, which is on October 20th, which was founded in 2010 in a response to the very public um, suicides of LGBT youth that were happening at that time because that they were being bullied. Um, and this is still a problem that's going on in, in the schools when people report that this happens or you know, people teach me, um, administrators aren't doing anything, no one is really stepping in to talk about it, to stop it. It's still this boys will be boys, oh kids are just mean to each other, um, not really an understanding of the seriousness of this situation. So this is still going on. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, maybe something that people don't think about, but this issue on HIV criminalization. That in many states, it's a felony or a very, very serious charge for someone who is HIV positive to have sex with somebody and not disclose to them their HIV status. Um, and the what this is then using and doing is then pushing people to not, I don't want to get tested because if I knew my status, if I don't know my status, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't get in trouble. And you had the case um, last year of Michael Johnson in Missouri, um, a young 23-year-old African-American man who was sentenced to 30 and a half years in prison for having sex with someone and Michael Johnson says that he disclosed his HIV status to his partners. The partners said no, he did not. Um, now he will be in prison for 30 and a half years. There are a lot of other things in the states like um, someone in Texas was um, sentenced on felony charges for spitting on a police officer and he was HIV positive. Um, so all of this, this kind of the criminalization of it just further stigmatizes people who are HIV positive, discourages people from getting tested, and really flies in the face of science because it doesn't differentiate between, like if I'm if someone who's HIV positive and on medication and undetectable, I cannot transmit the virus. And we know this, this is 
scientific facts through studies that have been done, but the, the, the legal language and aspect of it um, is still stuck somewhere in the 1980s, which basically felt, makes someone's body a felony or having sex with someone as attempted murder. Um, so it's something that um, on the broader issues um, is being discussed and looked at and how can we change that, update the language, or just, I think, personally get rid of them altogether, the, those, the criminalization laws, um, as they continue to uh, promote the stigma against people who are HIV positive. And I want to talk about that, that. So it's an interesting thing, too, in this battle of ideas and the legislation that happens, because I feel like there's really this interplay between legislation and increases in homophobia, transphobia, and, and violence. And I think a little bit on, this is touching on, on Flavio, that you see, um, so homophobia, transphobia exists. And then you get these pieces of legislation, whether it was the constitutional amendments against gay marriage or the bathroom laws, and this, and we see this with other instances too, when people are getting riled up about um, immigration issues, on anti-Muslim, um, Islamophobia stuff, that, they, that these pieces of legislation or the way that they're talked about in our public sphere then escalate um, violence or targeting against people um, in, in those communities. And I think that there's a very much a direct relationship about that or even um, uh, I think someone was writing um, during the time of these um, marriage equality and amendments and people that this kid, I think he was in Oklahoma, was watching the debates on television about this and he ended up committing suicide because in the public sphere of talking about these certain people are not really people or they're sinful or they're evil or they're less than and what impact that has on the communities in which are being discussed. So I think that also being able to take some of those issues off the plate because we won those struggles um, kind of disrupts that a bit. But I definitely think that there is this connection between putting forward these bathroom laws and then kind of poisoning the atmosphere and making it toxic just in the way that it's discussed as if being um, for transgender equality and for the bathroom laws are the same thing. If it's just apples and oranges and a difference in opinion when it's really not. Um, so, and I want to talk a little bit about this issue um, in, in Orlando in the Pulse nightclub shooting. And on June 12th, 49 people were murdered in the worst mass shooting in modern history. I know people have talked about that term. And I think that it's something in the way that uh, homophobia works, that it's not just pieces of legislation because there are questions about why when this happened and people were talking about it, you know, Donald Trump takes it and runs with it as this anti-terrorism thing. And Hillary Clinton said the same thing, different ways, but also talked about it in, in, in regards to terrorism and Islam. And then in other media terms of talking about it just in the notion of gun violence, which it obviously was, but it very rarely was actually talked about that this was an attack on gay people, on, on LGBT people in a nightclub, which was one of the hardest pieces, at least for me and other people, to wrap their minds around that this space that was meant to be where to feel safe, maybe the only place that I could feel safe because at home, in my community, not safe for me, but this place that I can come to and be myself and be around other people who accept me and are like me and I'm not fearful of kissing the person, I'm fearful of I'm just out dancing and having a good time and I start making out with someone that I'm going to be attacked and killed. But that that kind of shattered or disrupted by the fact that the the shooter went to um, a nightclub, went to a gay club and a gay bar, and there was something kind of um, hard to, to pinpoint about why that made it even more traumatic or 
more um, egregious that, that, that this happened in, in that way. Um, I'm going to stop there for a minute, and then I'm going to go to the last part on what I have on transgender equality. I don't know if anybody has any comments on that, or I can just move forward. Oh, two comments. Uh, um, oh, Flavio. Um, well, <laughs> I grew up in the gay community. My mom is um, a lesbian, and she was one of the founders of um, of a group that was supporting um, families that had, you know, children or families that were comprised of, you know, two two fathers or two mothers who had children. Um, and one thing that I found um, a lot in in going to all these things because I was going to my pride pride events and, and um, community events. So I was very, very little, and I found that that was kind of something that I saw with the Pulse nightclub thing, was the man had frequented the nightclub, and I do see a lot of, like, self-hatred, and I find that, you know, it, that's it's, 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 like, internalized shame um, that just comes to the community, and you can't, it's, like, it, it's inescapable, and the only place that you will feel that, that sense of safety and security are in those nightclubs, and, and I just, that was, I feel for me, was was why it was so extremely traumatic is because I think everyone, you know, has experienced that moment of, of shame in, in discovering their, themselves and their sexualities. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say how uh, proud I am to be part of the people's world in many ways and especially what we did around the Pulse attack. Um, if you go to uh, our website and search under Pulse, you will find commentary and you will find that um, CJ Atkins and Patrick Foote went to Orlando, interviewed people, talked to people, and brought this out to as many of our readers as possible. So I'm very proud of that. Another thing is that Sometimes we do the work. No. <laughs> Another thing is that um, what I've learned over the years is that it's, I don't know, this isn't a big deal, but it is in a way. It's easier to find children's books now for children who have two moms or two dads. And the only, the, at one point, the only thing you could get was, uh, uh, I, went, I went to Gay Pride with my, or something like that. It was the only kids book out there. Now there are there a lot. There's a plethora. And they're in libraries, they're in school libraries. There are programs to help teachers um, uh, deal with various types of intolerance and to be, and have welcoming classrooms and welcoming schools. And both, the, I mean, there's still some horrific problems we have to deal with, but there are some good signs. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, Flavio, oh. Well, I was just going to say about some people don't know that at one time the U.S. medical community decided we were we were a mental disease. Mental homosexuality was a mental illness. Do you know what year that was? That was finally repealed. I bet you Flavio knows. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So the American Psychiatric Association uh, got you know. Got rid of that in 1973, and uh, and with the last uh, release of the DSM, um, the, the idea that uh, someone who's transgender has a mental illness was also removed. And the, the DSM-5 came out over a period of five years, so I'm not exactly sure when that happened. But I just want to say, on, on the Pulse nightclub, the reason I think that it, it's so heinous is that that was an attack on our children. Right. I mean, like, you know, my, my partner and I, um, you know, we both sort of said this at the same time, you know, without having to say, I mean, it's an attack on what we call the baby queers. I mean, it's not, you know, there's not 30 to 40 year olds there, but there may have been. I mean, this was like, you know, 18 to 25 year olds. And it's, I think that's what's like, there was no one there to, you know, we feel protective over, uh, you know, young LGBT folks, and there was no one there to protect, so. No, I, 
mean, I think that, I mean, it's kind of faded, and some of the, some stuff is coming up now in in the media. Um, but I think that it, it's still there in, in the background and in people's minds and thinking about it and still digesting it. What all of that meant from the people who were shot. Uh, there were, I think, there was like some people, like someone's mom and the older people. But yes, it was mostly young people going out having a good time, maybe the only place that they can really feel themselves, and they were murdered. And it really kind of puts that fear in, well, is that going to happen to me when I go to the club? Although, I mean, that kind of possibility was always there, but this really um, brought it home, that what happens if, if I'm at the bar next time, is that going to happen to, to me? Um, and so are there really any safe spaces in, in what that means? Um, so I want to go on to the the, la the next part that I have on transgender equality, and I think that th this issue of transgender equality, you know, obviously LGBT has always been there, but I have to say both within and without the LGBT community that the issues um, that are particular and specific to trans individuals have really not been addressed. and. Um, whether that was, I think, from the early 2000s, the stuff about trying to leave the kind of trans, the, the T off LGBT when you're for, for, um, putting forward um, legislation, and it has a lot to do with transphobia both inside and outside the LGBT community. And it's really about time, um, and not great that it's coming, um, that, or has now come into addressing this because of the, uh, the discriminatory legislation and other things that are happening, although it was very much connected before that with um, Caitlyn Jenner and Janet Mock and others uh, who were trans women who were out and talking about their lives and, and who they are. Um, it kind of started there and then now it's morphed into this, this other thing. Um, so I want to talk about, um, so briefly give some aspects on, on the issue that the difference between biological sex and gender. And I think most people, when we think about biological sex, it has to do with our chromosomes XX or XY. And not thinking about or not knowing, um, myself not knowing for a long time either, that I mean, actually there are a lot of different chromosomal combinations besides XX and XY. So that's not necessarily what we can say if we say what is biological sex or what determines biological sex, that it's our chromosomes because if you are, uh, you know, perceived to be a man, you have XY. If you're a woman, you're perceived to be a woman, XX. It, it doesn't work like that. And there are a lot of people who have um, different chromosomal combinations and just those two that we are kind of thought about in science as that determines biological sex. And then you get into this issue on intersex. So if a child is born and they have what is denoted as ambiguous genitalia, which means that uh, either the clitoris is larger than what's considered to be normal or the penis is considered, or considered to be smaller than what is normal, uh, most people in the medical community also, although I think this, this is changing, um, decide to operate. And generally, because it's easier to make a vagina than a penis, do that operation and then assign the person um, their gender at birth as being a, a woman, even though that may not be what, what it was um, when they were born. So, so biological sex in and of itself is really subjective. Um, when we actually look at the science and what happens, that it's not this fixed binary that forever is the truth, and this is all it is, and all it ever will be is just men and women as they're defined now. Um, and so when it comes to gender and, and what I feel I am or how I want to express myself, it's completely um, divorced or separate from what biology or what the doctors or my family, whoever, assigns me as this sex at birth, um, and that there's no real connection between that because we we have the ability to determine 
who we are as individuals, how I want to express myself, how I want to look, how I want to dress, um, that doesn't have to be and is not restricted by these gender roles that are really sexist and patriarchal in their definition of how we define what someone who we perceive as a woman or someone who we perceive as a man to be. Um, and I think that when we talk about um, the transgender community, there's definitely uh, trans men, trans women, and then there's uh, another larger section that's on people who are gender nonconforming, gender queer, gender fluid, who um, express themselves in a variety of different ways. And I think that when we think about the issue of um, transgender, trans rights, I think it's better to be broader rather than narrow to really get the scope of what what gender means, how gender is used, how people express it um, in a way that's not necessarily, you know, how the media or our popular perception of it just being, um, you know, trans men and trans women. And I think that that's really kind of the radical liberatory aspect that why, why do I have to be determined because my genes say this or I have a beard or these characteristics and this is how I have to be, this is how I have to dress, this is how I have to act. And I can, give, I can be just who I want to be and I can express myself how I want to express myself and that's legitimate and it should be celebrated um, and not looked down upon or discouraged. And I think that that kind of in and of itself is a very radical and liberatory thing that we should be celebrating and promoting. And I think that this issue about being able to express yourself, who you are, your gender, that this, this issue of transphobia really, and I'm um, glad maybe it's coming on, on my, this class is on the heels of the issues on women's equality and the struggle against sexism, because I think the homophobia and transphobia most definitely are rooted in this issue of sexism and patriarchy. Because the, the problem is that it need patriarchy in order to exist, to say that there are men and there are women and men are better than women, you have to have these very rigid, defined genders and biological sex in order for it to work. And when you don't have that, the whole house of cards comes falling down. But there, there is no difference. There, there, there is no way then that men could be better than women if we throw out or complicate or negate this, this binary that we have set up. And this is really at the crux then of like what 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 is people's problems? Why why do you care how someone expresses their gender or themselves? What what does that have to do with you? And it really bucks up against this issue of patriarchy and misogyny and in the ways that, that and ideological structures that have to be created and maintained in order for that to be able to continue. And this issue about, you know, defining uh, yourself is very much wrapped up in issues of feminism and the women's struggle to define what, what for, for women to define for themselves, what does it mean to be a woman? How, as I as a woman, am supposed to dress? How am I supposed to act? What are, uh, you know, what are acceptable jobs for women and why is it being determined by men through a patriarchal lens? And so this, the, all of the, the issues about equal pay, attire, behavior, abortion rights, the issue of work inside the home as well as work outside the home, the, the, those issues also challenge and the norms and roles that, that are prescribed to women through like I said, the kind of patriarchal, misogynistic, ideological lens, and those directly relate to, into what, why someone would have issues with how someone would express themselves. And in particular, uh, and we'll get like the current struggles about violence against trans women, and why is it that violence against trans women, um, and generally when, when it happens, is extremely heinous, is extremely brutal, that, th that this violation that someone who was perceived as a man would want to live with the outward perception of society as a woman, and this massive transgression 
that a man would decide to do that and how terrible that is. And so, so part of that, what I'm going to talk about on the, the kind of current struggles is the violence against trans women that we, we refer have an epidemic of murders of trans women and trans individuals. The, so far this year, there have been 15 women, trans women who have been murdered, three trans men, and one gender fluid person. And oftentimes we don't hear about this, and then most of the violence is targeted at trans women of color. And then we don't hear about this happening because it's covered up, or the media uses the wrong pronouns and refers to the person in the wrong name, or it's just kind of, it happened, it doesn't get investigated, and but it's a serious, serious problem and we all need to be involved and, and take note um, when this when when we hear about these um, issues that when we hear about these issues that, are, that occur. Another um, issue in the kind of current struggle is in employment, where one in four trans individuals have reported that they have been discriminated in employment, and whether that's I I can get hired. If you come in this issue about passing, and that our society really idealizes trans individuals who continue to fit within the male-female binary. I mean, like when, you talk, when people were talking about Caitlyn Jenner, how beautiful she looks, and well, what about trans individuals who don't fit into that? When I go for a job and I don't fit into what these rigid gender roles are, am I going to get hired? Are people going to question me? Are they going to ask me, you know, what are you? And all of these issues kind of come up. And then there's really also like the, the problem of either underemployment or unemployment in the trans community where people are not able to get jobs. And then the consequence of this is that many trans individuals have to then go in uh, or forced into risky employment, whether it's through sex work or drug dealing that then further puts them into uh, harm's way about being uh, murdered or violence against them. This is a really serious issue. Another thing is about health care and access to health care. Insurance companies don't cover hormone replacement therapy. They don't cover cosmetic surgery. They don't cover top surgery. Um, and so I can't get access to this. And either I have to go to the street or not have it, but why is it that we that our insurance companies won't cover these things? And then not only not covering that, but then not having doctors who are knowledgeable about it, that are able to provide quality um, health care, and not only in the medical health, but also on mental health, and having people who understand what someone will be going through as they're transitioning or just or working through how I want to express my gender or who I am as a person or processing all of the transphobia that someone has to go through on a daily basis or even at home with their family. And on top of that, also about being able to work with families because um, there's also many trans individuals who have been murdered have been murdered by their family members because they weren't accepting of, of who they were. So this issue about healthcare in a very like broad sense, not just on medical pieces, but also on mental health, um, also you know is a very big issue. And then lastly, like we talked about in the bathroom laws, in North Carolina, you know it says that you can only use the bathroom to the gender you were assigned to at birth, not the gender that you identify with now. And seven other states have also um, been uh, put thinking about putting forward this type of um, legislation and it's really actually also enforced in a very sexist kind of way because there were reports of when this came out that there were uh, people who were women who were not trans and they were attacked and kicked out of bathrooms because they quote unquote didn't look like women. This goes into further policing people's bodies in particular women's bodies and saying Oh, because you don't look like a woman, you can't be in here. And what does that mean? How, who, who is determining what 
a woman, what a woman is supposed to look like, and the way that these things are, uh, you know, being enforced. Um, the Department of Justice, and they're not about this, you know, send a strong rebuke about it. This, these cases will probably make their all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they'll probably also include because the Department Obama administration um, put forward a directive that for the public schools, they have to provide um, bathroom and locker rooms to students to the gender that they identify with, not the gender that they were assigned to at birth. Um, and if you don't comply with this, you could possibly lose funding for your schools and your school districts. And obviously that really made a lot of people pretty mad um, about that too. So that, this lawsuit about the, um, the, the bathroom laws, um, I think will probably make its way up to the Supreme Court, and we will see um, what happens there. So I'm going to stop there on this before I get to the last part about uh, as the party, how can we get involved, and stop and see what, what people have um, any comments or questions about what I just said. Flavio. No, no, I, I have nothing. No, I'm sorry. I mean, Colby. Um, I'm guessing that you'll touch on this in the next section, but I guess I was hoping you could just comment on how these multifarious forms of discrimination might uh, concentrate these communities in the working class, and I guess based on um, our political practice, how that might then necessitate us making a special effort to reach out to these communities. Okay, Emiliano. Um. So we've talked about sexuality and gender, um, and I was, um, I was wondering if there's any, you know, what role does sensuality play, and how does sensuality different from sexuality and gender, without, you know, going down a deep rabbit hole, but if you have any thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah, so I, you know, I just wanted to say, um, you know, I live in Philadelphia, and in some ways it seems like, um, like all these issues are very, very alive in the culture of the city that I live in. And it's not just in, it's all, it's all to the city. I mean, I live in a predominantly black working class neighborhood. These issues are just are discussed all the time. And they, um, you know, they, they are, they, they have, they're, they have, really have changed like the whole discourse of coming from the public schools though you know it's it's worked its way into many of the facets of the way people live their lives in our city and it's really kind of you know remarkable to see this you know um, so I just I just wanted to comment on that and it just I, I'm trying to digest everything you're saying you're telling a lot and Oh, bear. Um, I'm making up for not participating during the meeting. The food, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. I said, you know, 
I really don't like the way women are treated in our society, and I don't like wearing skirts. Now, am I transgender or not? I'm, I'm confused on this. So <laughs> I was deadly serious. I had to figure out some of these things, and then somebody was trying to help me to understand it. So I appreciate, I mean, I'm pushing 70, so it's taken me a while, and I appreciate the help that we are getting from people who are articulate and, um, and experienced. Um, one other thing is, uh, Anne, did you already mention private work, or are you going to mention private work? Yes, okay. I will. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I, I want to comment about this issue on trans, uh, transgender equality and, and working class. And I think that obviously people who are in the working class are disproportionately affected by this issue on like access to health care or income and that. But when someone is coming in the bathroom, they don't care. The person who is wealthy, they're going to be have the same problems when it, when it comes to that implementation about that piece about the about the bathroom as as everybody and so while we should be talking about or emphasizing or putting forward or uh, making more clear on what happens with working class folks that this is a, a democratic issue this isn't just about working class trans folks or working class gay folks like the, like homophobia and transphobia impact everybody. And so it's not necessarily, I wouldn't want to then, then phrase this in, I mean, there is obviously issues that, that go into differences or the way that it's felt, but this is not, it, it's crossed class lines. This is a democratic um, issue. And I don't know, Emiliana, um, maybe if you can say a little bit more about what you mean by sensuality and the difference between that sexuality and gender expression because I'm I wasn't really sure what you were saying. I guess more um, and it's you know I mean it might not it, it might just be just a much broader discussion um, but you know my you know understanding the differences is you know you, you know you gender you know you could identify or you know express just you know as you know as man and sexuality you could be attracted to another man, but you could might not, you know, sensually not really want to have sex with anybody. So I guess it's just kind of, you know, the, the differences of, you know, being sensual and wanting to have sex with people or having, you know, and, and if that is a difference. So I guess it's more I'm posing it if there is, you know, if being sensual or, you know, and then, you know, and then the taboos about, you know, actually having sex or wanting to feel sexy or how do you, you know, because those are, those are very different things and sometimes with these, you know, these issues on morality is, you know, when, you know, when you start slut-shaming men and women and, you know, it's not so much, you know, well, it, do you feel that gender plays a big role in that or, I, you know, and again, it could be a much larger discussion, but I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that and if you do feel that, you know, those things do kind of just kind of correlate with each other. Well, I think what, what the problem is is that we don't have language to actually adequately describe that, that we're still stuck in. Uh, and I think that categories serve a purpose and, and definitions serve a purpose, but I, I, we don't have the language to actually be able to label or describe all of the variations of human sexuality, gender expression, um, how I want to have sex, how I, how I don't want to have sex. Um, we, we really literally just do not have the language because we really are just now starting to talk about the variations and to understand that this really exists on a spectrum. That it's not these neat classifications of A, B, C, and D, and everybody falls into those. When we're recognizing that those, you know, definitions and categories exist, but there's a lot of people who don't fit into those, don't want to fit into those, and so what is our language to talk about that? How do we talk about that? And I think that that's something that we struggle with, that we, we don't talk about it, and so how, how can we name it? How can we describe it? 
And I think that that is kind of a um, conundrum, I guess, is, is my take on what you were saying. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the last part about um, the party getting involved. And I think that there's, it's kind of like a struggle, because even for me, being gay and in, here in New York, like how do I get involved in stuff? There is really, I mean, there's like the, the LGBT task force, or the national, I don't even know what the, uh, the name of, I'm terrible about that, or like the human rights campaign, but there's really no like national organization that has like local clubs and stuff to really get involved in. And, and to be active. And then you saw after the marriage equality that a lot of the organizations that existed folded. Because that was kind of like the main rallying point that people were getting involved with or the main point of interest in, in engagement. Now that's kind of gone. And I think we're trying to figure out, well, what do I do? How do I get involved in this? There is no organization to join, so what, what do I do? And the, the first part I would say is, um, there are these national days of action that happen throughout the year that people can get involved with, whether you're on a college campus, in your workplace, just in the community. So there's Spirit Day that happens on October 20th like said, um, that, that was started in 2010, um, particularly about the suicides from school bullying. So that's something that people can get involved in that happens nationwide um, in public schools, K-12, and also on college campuses. And then there's a National Day of Silence that happens in April, which brings attention to, uh, and there's a lot on college campuses, and some in the K-12 too, where people um, sign a pledge to not speak that day. And this is kind of um, in challenging the silence, uh, silencing the voices of LGBT people or a way to make people aware of how many of us are in the presence. Um, what happens every April? The day kind of changes because it happens. It has to happen on a on a weekday. Um, there's also National Coming Out Day, which happens on October 11th every year. Then there's National Transgender Remembrance Day on November 20th, uh, which is a um, day of action. A lot of vigils that um, commemorate trans individuals who lost, um, were murdered. Um, and kind of bringing attention to this issue of violence against the transgender community. And that happens every November 20th. And then there's also World AIDS Day on December 1st um, that people should get involved in, find out about, because uh, we don't really talk about HIV and AIDS anymore. Um, it's kind of gone from our um, public discourse on um, treatment, um, discrimination, stigma, we really don't talk about it anymore. And it's still going on. It still needs to be talked about. There are still people dying. People can't get access to medications. Um, still a really big issue. And I think we need to be better at remembering that that is still going on. And as um, Barb said, if you're in a union, um, and even if you're not even in the union, I don't know how they work um, for people who are not, but there's pride at work which is the LGBT constituency group within the AFL-CIO. Um, they have national conventions. You can get involved by um, either bringing someone to your workplace to do trainings on LGBT issues, um, both uh, in, in the workplace, like interpersonal stuff, and then what are labor issues that are impacting um, LGBT uh, and you can also, I think, they do like a training the trainer, so you can do that as well. Um, so I really encourage people who are in a union to, to find out how to get involved in, in private work. There's also about getting more articles on these issues in the people's world. Um, I said, I, CJ and then did really great on reporting on the ground from Orlando, but the stuff should be in the people's world ongoing, so we need to have more people who are volunteering to write articles on both news and opinion um, on things that are coming up. I think we also need to get um, more writers, thinkers, presenters who are LGBT, particularly people who are transgender. Um, I'm presenting on this topic as a gay man. I'm not um, trans, and uh, so I think it's really important for 
us when we talk about this issue uh, of transgender equality that we work on developing um, people who are transgender to write about, think about this, and, and speak about this both in the party and in the public um, about what the party feels about this. I think also, um, as Rosanna, you were talking about earlier, and I think we should be using, um, you know, in the writing, there's a big push on gender neutral pronouns, so either they or them, um, rather than he or she, because we don't, until you know how someone wants to be addressed, you should address as a gender, gender neutral um, pronoun. And that goes for both in uh, interpersonal and then also um, in, in, in writing. And I think that it's important, like I said about some of the times when um, in, in the write-up in the media about um, transgender individuals who have been murdered, the family will use, um, will misname them. And that's really a disgrace. That's really this person who is murdered living as they are, and then you are remembering them or recording them by the name that they don't go by. Um, it's a really, uh, really awful. And I think that in, in our reporting, we should make sure they're really using correct names and, and pronouns. And I think um, also on this issue, um, I don't know how it is at the, the worker center, but we should definitely on the issue of bathrooms, either gender neutral or make them accessible to um, people who are using them as the gender that they identify with. Um, rather than just having male, female bathrooms. Um, and I think also um, getting more involved in pride parades that are happening, either going out and marching, getting involved in other organizations who have um, floats or participating, I think is a really great way. And if you talk to people who march as their local club, um, many of the times that they have very extremely positive um, experiences and reception um, in the in the pride parades, and so I really think that in, in wrapping this up, that the struggle for LGBT equality is not a side issue. It's not only one that those of us who are LGBT should be concerned about or talking about. But we all have a stake in this together. And then I would say that this issue is an integral, if not essential, piece of the struggle for democracy, justice, and defeating the ultra-right here in the U.S., both on that ideological level. I mean, you imagine, I think the Republican Party is going to see this, that as younger people come up and they're more open and accepting and have different viewpoints on this issue, um, it's going to really be a losing battle. And I think that we, we have worked to, to win that and to turn the tide on on this issue and, and going going forward, um, and also as I said before about the issue of you know using these pieces of legislation um, as ways to get people to the the voting booth. And what I want to say too, that like this issue in North Carolina makes it shows kind of the importance of local elections. That the people who are elected in North Carolina, um, I don't know for the individuals who created the bill. Did they actually say that they were going to do this when they were getting elected? Because they often have this big switch where they talk about one thing, get into office, do something completely heinous and ridiculous that outside of what they were talking about. But it goes to show on a lot of this stuff on the local level and how important that is. And the connections then between, you know, I'm sure that the same people who made this bathroom law are spouting out all kinds of stuff about rolling back health care, about you know anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, Islamophobia, all of that other right-wing crap that they spout, and that this is a, a piece of that. And we should also like, be making those connections, and that, that you know the people who are anti-worker are the same people who are putting out these anti anti-gay, anti-transgender laws and how that kind of all fits together and why we all need to be on the same side of this if we're going to be moving forward. So I guess that's it for me that I have. I don't know if people have any last comments and then we'll wrap up.